harvest time, the harvest of yesterday's planting. Tomorrow, the harvest of today's earnest efforts. Wherever men dream and plan and toil for themselves and others, the harvest must come. Throughout the world each day, there is somewhere a harvest time. When spring begins in Canada, the ripened grain is yellow on the Nile. When winter comes to the Argentine, Nebraska corn is standing in full flower. Throughout the world each day, there is somewhere a harvest time. And each day is the harvest of yesterday's planting. From small beginnings sometimes come abundant harvests. From a tiny workshop came the vision that built a million miles of highways. From this rude bench and lathe and drill have sprung the tools for 80,000 men. From this small shop has grown a city of work and opportunity, an industrial city covering a thousand acres, a city drawing visitors from all the world who come to wonder and to learn. Each year, more than a million visitors come to Dearborn, Michigan. They gather here at the Rotunda, a permanent guest house at the gateway to the Rouge. Here, before visiting the plant, are presented the latest tangible shapes into which the Ford idea has been molded. Built of welded steel and safety glass, powered by continuously refined V-type 8 and 12 cylinder engines, streamlined and graceful in appearance, here is presented the latest addition to the Ford and Lincoln line. A new car, a new name, a new value, the Mercury 8. These cars embody all the advanced performance, economy and safety principles that have been learned by Ford engineers and production experts in more than 35 years of experience, constant research and scientific pioneering. And so from all over the world and from over all America come visitors by the thousands daily. Some are everyday citizens as you and I. Some are industrialists, scientists, students, business leaders. Some are eminent engineers. Why does this one industrial city attract so many visitors? What have they to learn? What is there here that is unique in the entire automotive industry? What is there here that creates advantages for purchasers when automobile values are appraised and compared? What is there back of these products plain an exceptional standard of quality for the price? Well, the answers to these questions will be given to you because the answers are here at the Ford and Lincoln plants. For example, this is a city of transportation where carriers of materials and things lighten and lessen the task of building carriers of men and burdens. Where builders of transportation are the greatest users of transportation to bring materials and things to forge, to lathe, to bench, to the busy hands of men. For the city of transportation is a complete city, a city founded upon an idea, a different idea, a city whose every source and resource bring here the means, find here the methods, join here the opportunities to work, to tend, to spin, to weave, to form and transform so that from within this city of transportation great values in transportation are made available to the world. The most important item in the building of a quality product of the highest possible value is one that the visitor to the Rouge plant may never see. It's the thought and study, the painstaking research that develops better things and new things to produce greater values at less cost. 
here, before today's new products were built, months were spent in developing new alloy steels. Intricate apparatus was designed and erected to detect sounds and vibrations, to record them and locate the cause and source of noise in a traveling car and learn new ways to overcome it. New materials were developed to aid this accomplishment, sound deadening materials, so that today's new cars are quiet on the highways, inside and out. Thought and study in the same research efforts are bringing and ensuring continual advances in the precision manufacture of materials and parts, in the development of apparatus that will measure the dimensions of parts in ten thousandth of an inch and judge the smoothness of surface finishes in millionth of an inch, which has brought about the micro-mirror finishing of parts to retard wear and lengthen their span of life. In addition to mechanical and metallurgical research, Thought and study in the field of chemistry have for years been devoted to the development of new uses for farm products. Until today, the American farmer helps to build motor cars, just as the motor car manufacturer helps to make farming more efficient and convenient. They help each other, and that helps the country. For example, for every million cars produced, there is an annual purchase of 3,200,000 pounds of wool. 1,500,000 square feet of leather, beeswax from millions of honeybees for electric embedding compounds, 69 million pounds of cotton, 500,000 bushels of corn, 2,400,000 pounds of linseed oil, 2,500,000 gallons of molasses, 2 million pounds of turpentine, and 69 million pounds of rubber for the 203 rubber parts in the modern automobile. These, together with other purchases from more than 7,000 suppliers, total hundreds of millions of dollars, spreading work and wealth into every state of the Union. And this vast purchasing is an established policy here for a sound economic reason. Industry must buy from others if it is to sell to others, for industry is a process of give and take. It is cooperation among many forces and many interests. And because industry must buy and must create jobs and wages if it hopes to sell, village industries have been fostered and aided in their development, so that in agricultural regions there will be useful work to do when harvests of the fields have been gathered. One of the most interesting of these harvests, because it shows the trend, is soybeans. For every million cars produced, 600,000 bushels are used annually for the manufacture of enamels and for plastics, electrical parts and similar parts. But while scientists and engineers are important to the development and perfection of new ideas, new things in transportation, it is equally important that motor cars have a style and beauty that do more than please the eye, an appearance that expresses swift transportation with comfort and safety. And it is here that today's designs were developed. It is here that tomorrow's designs are being planned. After principles are thoroughly tested, they are embodied in experimental models built in the laboratories. And the next step is the weather tunnel the only full-size weather tunnel in the United States, where the world's worst weather in all conceivable combinations is created to order. The findings in this weather laboratory, the first of its kind to be built expressly for scientific research into motor design and operation, are checked with actual road conditions on one of the world's largest test tracks, where today's cars, while still in the experimental stage, were driven thousands of miles at high speed, where they were tested on brick paving, checked for safety on wet asphalt, pounded over cobblestones to prove stamina, and over rough, uneven roads to make certain that all factors contributing to comfort have been improved. Here, too, the cars are checked and double-checked with sound recording 
and proved in action to be quiet beyond all comparison. They are checked for safety, for durability, for economy, for comfort, to the end that new ideas, new things, new materials in today's Lincoln, Lincoln Zephyr, Mercury and Ford cars and trucks are thoroughly tested. For here, nothing is approved until it is proved. But what are some of the things that draw people here from all over America, from all over the world? Almost any large industrial operation is spectacular. But what is there here that differs advantageously, is unique, that explains an outstanding ability in this industry to offer more for less? Why does this plant produce its own electricity? Electrical power can be purchased. Why does this plant have huge blast furnaces to produce its own iron? Iron can be bought. Blast furnaces need coke, and coke too can be purchased. Why does the Rouge plant make its own coke? Why does this one plant produce gas, steel, plastics, plate glass, and even many of the tires with which its cars are equipped? These things can be bought, are bought, by most all manufacturers. Why are there company-owned iron mines, coal mines, and rubber plantations? Why a fleet of ships, 14 locomotives, and over a thousand freight cars? First, it is to acquire the experience and knowledge necessary to increase quality and reduce costs through better methods. And this valuable information is free and has contributed to all industry through the years. Second, these many and diversified manufacturing operations here keep each one upon an actual cost basis, not cost plus profit on many individual parts of the car. So there is just one profit on the finished product when it rolls off the line. These things are the mainspring of a mechanism that is unique. They cultivate an idea and harvest an ideal. The idea is to find more efficient, less wasteful ways to use nature to make men more free. The ideal is always to find means of spreading the results of scientific achievement more widely among mankind. So great is an idea, so mighty is an ideal, that within half a man's lifetime, a tiny workshop has grown into the world's largest industrial development that is continually improving, creating, and contributing not only its products, but its methods, so that other industries have benefited because many Ford methods have been made available to them. Here during the last year, $34 million have been spent as a part of a permanent program for progress, founded upon faith in tomorrow. It is faith that business could be worse and will be better. Confidence that is found whenever you find enlightened industrial management. Here, for example, is a confidence that has built a power plant that produces enough electric power to meet the domestic needs of the city of Chicago. A plant which daily uses hundreds of tons of coal, as well as 31 million cubic feet of gas and enough water to supply the cities of Detroit, Cincinnati, and Washington. 2,500 tons of iron ore are used daily, ore from company-owned mines transported in company-owned ships. Tons of silica sand, soda ash, salt, limestone, charcoal, and cullet are consumed daily in the manufacture of safety glass in a huge plant where there is a polishing table so long it was constructed to conform to the curvature of the earth. Thousands of tires are now being manufactured in the world's most advanced tire factory, and the volume of production will increase as rubber becomes available from Ford-owned plantations on the Amazon. Every 24 hours, these batteries of coke ovens produce 3,475 tons of coke from coal to be used mainly in the blast furnaces, in the melting of iron ore, but many other products are recovered or produced in this process to be used or sold and to save at every point of manufacture so that these savings may serve to give more quality at less cost. For example, the thick brown gaseous smoke that used to overhang the old beehive type coke ovens is here carried to a byproducts plant through overhead pipes where a number of washing, condensing and recovering operations produce from it 45,000 gallons of coal tar used throughout the plant as fuel. 
100,000 pounds of ammonium sulfate, a fertilizer which Ford markets through its dealer organization, 11,850 gallons of light oil. And by mixing 25% refined light oil with 75% standard gasoline, 42,000 gallons of motor benzol are produced every 24 hours, which finds a ready sale in the gasoline filling stations throughout the Detroit area. From the coke ovens, the coke is carried by conveyors to the blast furnaces, where the idea of efficiency to cut waste begins with the recovery of the flue dust that is caught and sintered for melting. And here, during full production, no pigs of iron are cast only to be subsequently remelted. The iron in its molten state is transported directly to the world's largest foundry where technical advances in the casting of metal are being made regularly and where the V8 engine block is cast in one piece. Other ladles filled with molten iron from the blast furnaces go directly to the open hearth furnaces where steels of many kinds are produced. More than 63 different kinds of steel are used in the manufacture of the Ford car. 38 for the cars themselves and others for dyes and tools. And meanwhile, an industry within an industry is devoted to other savings that are passed on to Ford and Lincoln buyers in the shape of better cars, sharing in the profits from these efforts. For example, waste paper that accumulates at the Rouge plant is made into tons of paper used for packing and other production purposes. Every scrap of wood, of rubber, of metal, string, cloth, or leather is used, no matter how small it may be. Waste oil that inevitably pollutes a river flowing close beside any large factory is here reclaimed. 600 gallons of it a day and used for oiling roads and for fuel. The dust from grinding wheels contains metal particles of the parts smoothed on the wheels. Even this dust is reclaimed and it yields tons of metal. Slag from the blast furnaces is granulated and piped to a separate plant where it is utilized in making Portland cement. Nails are carefully saved as a safety measure for future use or for the scrap metal they will yield. Tons of nails are salvaged annually and so on almost endlessly so that each car benefits from the savings affected throughout the plant. Each car is a better value for the buyer than if each had been produced by a separate company. And the final cost of a Lincoln, Mercury, Ford car or truck is the lowest possible cost not a cost plus carelessness and waste, and not a cost that includes several profits. The savings affected by Ford engineering and manufacturing technique amount to millions of dollars annually, which are passed on to the motorists in the form of better automobiles. Shortcuts and savings here are made with machines and materials, not with men. And it is this efficiency which makes the work go faster, not the men an efficiency which produces higher quality at less cost and at high wages. It is here that the world's largest builder of transportation is also the world's largest user of transportation in the form of 150 miles of conveyors, which bring the work to the man so that the man does not have to go to the work. It is the conveyor that makes the work easier, the burdens lighter, and thus enables men to produce more earn more, not as day laborers, but as specialists in their line. When men must wait for parts or materials or else lift heavy burdens from distant conveyors, unproductive seconds add to the cost of manufacturing an automobile. And so every job is engineered for them to conserve their strength, to ease their burdens, for it is by saving men that seconds are saved. And it is through the savings of seconds in one place that at another point on the line, minutes can be spent to ensure the highest possible quality in every part produced. Here, for example, in a lead-walled room, steel is examined for hidden flaws by powerful x-rays. Dozens of these plant laboratories dot the production line. In another room, engineers test Ford parts with twisting, jerking, pounding, bending, and squeezing machines. Springs are bent and flexed and deflected thousands of times. Pistons are crushed. 
terrific pressure is put against gear teeth. Plated parts are given soft baths for hundreds of hours to test resistance to corrosion. Paint, oil, rubber and textiles must pass rigid examinations. All this is done close to actual production so that research and testing go hand in hand with manufacturing at every stage. Thus, minutes are spent because seconds are saved to the end that values can be multiplied. And when you see inspectors checking parts for accuracy to dimensions measured in ten thousandths of an inch, you see where quantity production of quality products actually begins. Because parts must fit together perfectly or more seconds and costly seconds would be wasted. It is the combination of all these that explains why thousands of people from all over America and from all over the world visit this plant each day. They know that here is a fountainhead of industrial and technological progress has raised standards of production methods all over the world. They see that the more anyone has of success, the more everyone can have. And leaving, each carries with him this thought. This is the only plant of its kind in the world. And from only one plant, this plant, could these cars come at these prices. And so, this is the time of the harvest, the harvest of the years. A harvest founded upon an idea dear from the mind of a man to whom it is always early morning in America.